We live in a community which increasingly seems to have an anger management problem and unfortunately when it gets domestic that makes things even worse and the reason I'm talking about this now is because police are warning thousands of women that orders protecting them from violent former partners may need updating to ensure their safety. A Supreme Court ruling means that intervention orders issued by police and approved by the courts should no longer ban an abuser from being in the vicinity, quote, of a victim because the term is too vague. Now, this is a, this is a problem that ought to be solved pretty easily. I mean, I would have assumed, being a layperson, that instead of saying in the vicinity, say within 400 metres, two kilometres, what, whatever, it, wouldn't that be non-vague? Wouldn't that be specific? Well, let's first of all talk to Senior Associate at Tyndall, Gaskin, Bentley, Rachel Shaw. Rachel, thank you for talking with us. Why can't we fix it fairly easily? Um, well, Leon, in intervention orders, usually there's... I'm looking at some that are files I have right now. Yeah. Most of my files, there's at least 16 um, that I see orders that are usually placed upon somebody who is subject to an intervention order. So any of the orders which had in the vicinity in them would have also been accompanied by, as I said, up to 16 other orders, which mm -hmm. would have included things like the person must not have threatened or harass, can't follow the person, can't contact or mm. communicate. So uh, I'm not um, seeing the vicinity issue necessarily practically being a problem. But of course people are entitled, if they are concerned, to, to go to the court and I know the police have indicated that they will assist them mm. in getting something more concrete than vicinity. Because I agree that is a an ambiguous term. Well, as we understand it, and it's widely published in the media today, that police officers dealing with old orders have been instructed not to make arrests based on breaches of in the vicinity clauses and in, instead look to, for ways to prove a breach of another clause. Yes, and I would have thought when you've got 16 clauses mm. that there would be plenty of options uh, to arrest someone for breaching an order. Um, if, for example, I suspect that if someone has called the police because a defendant or the former partner has been in their vicinity, mm. then obviously they've felt intimidated. And that is a common uh, order that's made, that someone yep. cannot intimidate someone. So if someone was to call the police and say, yes, he's in my vicinity and I'm intimidated, then that would immediately be grounds for the police to use to arrest the person. All right. Stay on the line. Let's talk with... Uh the officer in charge of family and domestic violence. This is a person who probably has a job not many would want, but somebody's got to do it. It's Detective Superintendent Joanne Shanahan. Joanne, thanks for joining us today. Can you put your perspective on this? Certainly. Look, I think what Rachel has um, already discussed is still quite valid, but it's a reminder for people that they are still protected. So for protected, per for protected persons named in the order, they are still protected. This yeah. is, as Rachel said, this is one of those clauses or one of those conditions on the order. And it's a reminder, too, for the defendants um, in this that the order is still valid and that they must not breach the order. We mm. will take action. You know, it is an offence for defendants to disobey any term of that intervention order. Yeah. And there's maximum penalties for that. So, you know, we want to make sure that um, people are aware. Um, I don't want to alarm and... Um, create any hysteria out there no. but it is important that people are aware that one part of that clause in the order um, has been brought up in the Supreme Court recently and we are working with victims in relation to this. Alright, now while I've got you there, approximately how many intervention orders do we have in this state, do you know? We've got several thousands, I know uh, the numbers that were printed in the media today um, quoted just over um, two and a half thousand. So um, orders we've got in that we've got over a thousand thousand that uh, are breaches, yeah. and quite often those breaches are multiple breaches. I haven't got the latest statistics for you for no, the fine. last financial mm. year, but there are thousands of intervention orders, and generally um, most of those uh, intervention orders aren't breached. You know, defendants comply with those orders, but unfortunately, we do see that we have some people that. Um, do not comply with intervention orders and police do take action. Okay. Um, 
Superintendent, uh, the other question is, and this is what, something that's been put up by a couple of listeners, is there a situation sometimes where a person has gone out, a potential victim, to get an intervention order because they want to be safe, and then they've contacted the person from, uh, from which they are, are not allowed to have contact because they shouldn't be harassed or feel intimidated. Does that create a complication? Oh, certainly. I mean, the order is there for both parties to abide by. Yeah. Um, so it's important for the protected person to abide by those orders and also the defendant. Yeah. So, uh, again, so if you've got an, uh, an intervention order against somebody, the, the silliest thing you can do is actually make, an, <laughs> make a, uh, some effort to contact them. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And um, the police officers that take the order do provide a lot of information on intervention orders. We've got uh, the SAPOL page, the internet yeah. page. Yeah. Um, if any member of the public wants to go to that SAPOL page, we've got information about the um, the warning that we are giving people in relation to the, the latest Supreme Court judgment. Yeah. And also there's a whole booklet on information about intervention orders which spells out every single aspect of it. Yeah. You know, what to do, um, if there's a breach, what to do, who to call, all right. um, et cetera. It's all there for people and they can get that from a police station as well if they need to. Joanne, one final question and I'll, I'll ask the same thing from Rachel shortly, but from your point of view, what are the, the general grounds from which an intervention order would be appropriate in your judgment? Well, generally, the, the grounds that we have is, like you mentioned earlier, about within so many metres of yeah. some sort of boundary. Absolutely. Yeah. And from October the 2nd, we work with the courts, and we do have that on the order. It's the ones before that date that may have in the vicinity of. And importantly, lots of other pieces of legislation use that mm. terminology as well, in the vicinity of. So, um, but we do have things like not assault, threaten, harass or intimidate. Yeah, sure. The protected person. So, if there is someone in the old terms, we might have said in the vicinity of their home address, if they're outside, they could be deemed to be harassing and intimidating the person. Yeah. Uh, quite often, there's a term there to follow or keep the protected person under surveillance. Yeah. If they're outside or in the vicinity of their workplace, we could say that they may be doing that as well. Mm. Uh, they can't communicate with that person, and we include communication to be phone, SMS, email, Facebook, sure. Skype, yeah. everything, damaging property, enter certain locations. Don't go into ed education facilities. So um, it's very broad, uh, the conditions that we do put on. So that's why that just that one terminology of in the vicinity of, um, we've got lots of other safeguards there in the order. Joanne Shanahan, thank you. That's the detective superintendent in charge of uh, the family and domestic services at SAPOL. Rachel Shaw, uh, generally speaking, how hard is it for somebody to get an intervention order? What are the criteria upon which someone like yourself would say, that's what you need here? Well, the criteria is set out in the legislation. So Parliament has enacted legislation which is clear as to what the criteria is. Yeah. And that is that if it is reasonable to suspect that somebody will, without intervention, commit an act of abuse against a person, yeah. and the order is appropriate. and. An act of abuse is defined under the legislation with many examples. So it's not just what we would consider to be assault and injuries, emotional harm as well. So if somebody mm. believes that they, somebody else will, without intervention, emotionally or psychologically harm them, mm. there's also other examples of abuse such as um, denial of financial autonomy, damage to property, um, uh, and psychological harm is very broad. This, this denial of financial autonomy, it is mm -hmm. not unusual for couples to pool their resources. Yes. When something goes sour, mm. one of them or both might say, well, we don't want this uh, dual bank account, dual asset thing anymore. Mm -hmm. And one partner might say, well, I want out of this. And the other one might say, well, I'd like that too, but it's going to be a little bit hard. Uh, are these things normally easily negotiable? Because when, when you say financial independence, I understand what you mean. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, you know, when, you, when you're in love and you're romantic with somebody and you do things, and then when it gets sour, you think differently about everything, don't you? Yes, and this is the, the part of where the criminal courts and the family courts clash because the criminal courts are obviously only dealing with matters which uh, are criminal 
and which they have jurisdiction over. Mm. And a lot of the financial debates and argument between couples and former couples has to be resolved in the family court. And so there's a lot of crossover between the two courts and often magistrates get frustrated and indicate to parties that their real grievances should be aired in the family court. Yeah. All right, Rachel, thank you for joining us. That's Senior Associate at uh, Tyndall Gas Bentley.